السلام عليكم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه إجمعين one two Give me one second. I'll explain. It will all make sense. Yeah, just one second, inshallah. Okay. So it, it all began when I left for vacation for a week. Uh, I left a gallon of milk in my car. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't tilted over, but it was enough time for like the milk to kind of like bubble and cause a leak. <laughs> so I came home and it smelled like, smelled like sin, uh, <laughs> which is a joke, but also Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he one time said that if you could smell sins, you couldn't sit next to me. And so when I got in the car, it smelled so bad. SubhanAllah, that was the first thing I thought of was like, man, imagine if people could smell our sins, SubhanAllah. So I was, you know, I was like, all right, how do I get this out? I Googled everything. I'm just here to tell you if this ever happens to you, nothing Google says works. <laughs> I did everything. And then I got it detailed last night, did not work. So the dealership was nice enough to like, I think they just felt bad for me, Miskeen. So I dropped it off and now he's dropping it off here, the guy who, uh, the guy from the dealership is detailing it. I don't know where he is, but. Um, okay, well, Bismillah. So let's see. So they worked on it for five hours today. And if this doesn't work, then we have to replace some of the foam, unfortunately. But khair. it's okay. Everything bad that happens to us is kafara for the sins that we committed. So on the Day of Judgment, I'm going to be grateful that this happened, inshallah. I'm, I'm therapizing myself in front of you. <laughs> so you can see how to do this. All right. Bismillah. Okay, so uh, welcome to 30 and up. Welcome back after our Eid break, alhamdulillah. Um, for those of you who were with us uh, in the previous session, we did uh, about 20 sessions of a book called Practical Spirituality or Hadith on Spirituality, uh, narrations from the Prophet Muhammad's life. Um, and we, we finished, it was, it was pretty, mashallah, the themes were like, you know, very diverse and we, we varied across a lot of different topics. Um, I wanted to start tonight uh, one of my favorite books. Um, and again, 30 and Up is, is all about this, uh, this point in life where it's no longer just about simply being like inspired by something. Inspiration, of course, is part of it. But it's also about being able to take substance when you leave, right? Because inspiration can only last for so long. But really, the substance that you carry with you is what's going to develop your foundation. It's what's going to allow you to, to blossom and bloom and, and grow fully, right? So we're trying to set the roots right now, no pun intended. So this book is called Ayyuhal Walad, which is translated as Dear Beloved Son. And it's actually, I don't know, anyone ever read this before? Okay, so you may have read it before. So Ayyuhal Walad is actually not a book written as a book. It's actually, uh, it's almost like memoirs. It's like letters. It actually is letters. Letters written from a teacher to his student. And the backstory goes that the teacher, whose name is Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali, rahimahullah, was given a letter by one of his students. And his student essentially wrote to him and said, You know, Sheikh, I've studied with you for 20 years, right, a long time. And now I want to, I want you to tell me, after all this time we spent together, like, give me the summary of it all. Give me like what it actually means. Because we've gone over a lot. 20 years, can you imagine? And he goes, just give me like a summary. Give me like the, the nectar, the sweetest point of all of this. And so Imam Ghazali, he responds back to him. And he writes back to him 21 different letters. Some of them are short. Some of them are one line. And some of them are quite long. They're like two or three pages. But each of these letters addresses a certain theme and a certain action or a certain system of belief and of spiritual uh, growth 
that Imam Ghazali wants to let his student know is the core of what they've studied. So the reason why I wanted to read this book was because no doubt in your Islamic life, you have heard a variety of things, yes or no? You've heard a lot. A lot of people have heard a lot of things, some of them more useful than others, some of them not very useful, quite honestly. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to go back to building a stronger and refining our foundations with this text. Because this is somebody, Imam al-Ghazali, who at the, is at the end of his life at this point, close to the end of his life, and this is being asked by a student of his that has like 20 years of experience. So this isn't inspiration for the sake of inspiration. This is like very veteran, very senior advice. Not that you have to be experienced or advanced, but this is like hearing it from somebody that's been in it for a long time. You know, if you talk to somebody that's worked in their field for six months or one year and you ask them, give me advice, they'll give you advice. If you ask for someone that's worked in it for 20 years, the advice will be very different, extremely different. So we're gonna be reading this book, inshallah, cover to cover. Uh, I'm gonna be ordering copies of it for everybody, inshallah, so you'll be able to have a copy to take home uh, and just you know, write notes. I want you to absolutely destroy the book, meaning I want you to write all over it, right? Reflections, notes, realizations, and we're gonna be reading it in like a didactic format, inshallah, talking back and forth, and the recordings will be uploaded and podcasted and all that good stuff, inshallah. So for those of you who are listening online, you'll be included in this. Okay. So the first thing that we need to think about, the first lesson from this book, is that it actually is before we even get started. Let me take this, because everyone's going to start reading. You do that, and everyone's eyes go there. The first lesson in this text is that you are never, ever too old or too knowledgeable or too advanced to get started. You're never too old to get started. I know many of us sitting in this room are experiencing maybe like a little bit of imposter syndrome. All right, so we're coming to an Islamic gathering, we're listening to a lecture, we're dressed a certain type of way or whatever, but we know deep down that we don't know very much Quran, maybe we struggle to read it properly, maybe we don't have any Islamic knowledge background whatsoever. And so sometimes you walk into this type of gathering or you're sitting like trying to learn and the reality is that you feel this overwhelming sense of like vacancy internally. You're like, I actually don't have much. So what, how much can I take from this? And then you look at the person next to you and he's wearing a thob or she's wearing an abaya and her hijab matches. And you're like, there's no way. And the tag is in Arabic and you're like, I am out of my league, right? The dude next to you's beard is very big, double fist length. And you're like, there's no way. I can't, I can't keep up. I don't know anything. Well, let me tell you the good news. The good news is that this book was written as a response to somebody who had the humility to say, I don't know, after 20 years of study. That was his conclusion. If someone can study for 20 years and conclude, I don't know, then it shouldn't be hard for us in our beginning to say, I don't know. We don't have that much on the line. If you had two decades on the line, it's easy for you to kind of front a little bit. But if we're just getting started, if we feel, or maybe we have a little bit, we've spent some time, whatever, it's okay to begin by saying, I don't know. Everyone say, I don't know. Look, no one died. No one got hurt. No one fainted. It's okay to admit that. Imam Malik said, Nisfu ilm la adri. Half of knowledge is a person saying, I don't know. Much of the mistakes and the stumbles and the arrogance and whatever distasteful experiences people have in faith and spirituality begin by a person refusing to admit, I don't know. What was Iblis's downfall? What was Shaitan's downfall? Shaitan's downfall was that he thought he knew better than Allah. He thought he knew. Allah commanded them to bow, he did not bow. Instead of him saying when he was asked, why didn't you bow? Instead of him saying, you know what, Allah, I messed up. I made a mistake. That's what Adam did when Adam went near the tree and ate from the tree. And Allah said, why did you go near the tree? Adam said, I messed up. Right? Allah Ta'ala taught him how to repent. He repented. That's, that's virtually equivalent to saying, I don't know. I messed up. Shaitan couldn't say that. Another example of an important, and again, even well-meant, well-intended, I don't know, are the angels. The angels, when Allah Ta'ala announces his creation 
to the, to the creation. When Allah Ta'ala announces his creation to the cosmos, the angels are confused because the angels are perfect creation in the sense that they don't commit sins, they don't disobey Allah, they don't do anything wrong. So when Allah says he's going to create human beings, the angels respond with a very logical question. What is that question? Who knows it? You don't have to know it. I, like, you don't have to know the verse. Yeah, and then they said, and we? Well, they, didn't, they actually didn't say that part, but Allah said, so they said, you got the first part, you nailed it. Are you gonna, you're gonna put on earth people that will corrupt the earth, destroy it, and will spill blood. All they will do is cause conflict and corruption, and they'll destroy this beautiful earth. You know, I was in California last week. I'm not a California homer, okay? It's a great place to visit. And I was staring at this, like the coast and the greenery and the ocean, and I was like, what must this place have looked like, Earth, before us? Like, how beautiful must it have been? You know, you go to some places, and it's just this concrete industrial, looks almost like a, 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 a wasteland, right? And I was going to say something I shouldn't say. You go to New Jersey, and, you know... <laughs> It's just rough, you know? New Yorkers like that one, right? So you go to New Jersey, it's just rough. You're like, what on earth or Indiana? And you're like, what is going on, right? And it begs, you beg, I couldn't, I can't control my tongue. It, it begs to be asked, like, subhanAllah, like, what have we done? What have we done? And the Quran actually says this. The Quran says that human beings will have spread corruption through the earth and the ocean. And we will have, by, 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 the, by, the, by our own doing, right? So the angels were spot on. They knew us before we even were here. And then spill blood. I mean, people are, you know, one of the signs of the day of judgment, the Prophet said, is that a person will be killed, and the one who is killing won't know why they're killing, and the one who's being killed won't know why they're being killed. What just happened in Texas three days ago? Baby was sleeping. The neighbors asked the neighbor, please don't, please don't shoot in your front yard. Our baby is sleeping. It's 11. And the guy goes and calls the person who's killing doesn't know why he's killing. And the person who's being killed doesn't. This is a sign. The Prophet Islam said this. He said there will come a time. You see, even in conflict, there was, there was dignity. Even in conflict, there were rules. Right? But now it's, so the angels nailed it. And, but then Allah Ta'ala said in response, even though the angels were accurate in their, in their depiction of us, Allah says, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamu. I know that which you don't know. And the scholars, they elaborate on this one small statement because it's very, it's very vague, it's open-ended. But Imam al-Ghazali says, and I really, really appreciate his analysis, he says, Allah saying, I know that which you don't know, because they didn't say anything good. All they said was what? Bad stuff. Him saying, I know that which you don't know, is Allah saying in part, the good that they will do will outweigh the bad. You have to be optimistic. You have to have hope. As human beings, you have to have hope. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says that humans are destroyed, humanity is done, the Prophet ﷺ said, they are the most destroyed because they have no hope. Right? So it's important, Allah Ta'ala is reminding the angels even that moment, humility is the first step of any journey of getting close to Allah. Shaytan demonstrated that if a person cannot humble themselves, they won't get close. Okay? So his student asked this question. Then Imam Ghazali responds. He says, May Allah grant you a long life as his obedient servant, and may he place you in his service alone. He makes dua for his student. Someone asks you a question, sometimes you like you want to rush to answer it. Imam Ghazali begins by making dua. But he doesn't make dua, may Allah Ta'ala give you, you know, abundance and wealth, and may Allah Ta'ala give you you know, endless provision and a happy marriage and this and this. Those are all nice things. What does he say? He says, may Allah Ta'ala give you a long life as his servant. See, Muslims are the only people in the history of the world and in the current world that the height of their existence is servitude. That's the height of our existence. The Prophet ﷺ said, Sayyidul Qawm Khadimuhum. 
The master of people is the one who serves them. We actually aspire to serve. How many of you guys feel nice hosting somebody well? How many of you guys feel nice cooking for somebody, serving them a nice meal? And subhanAllah, we are so, it's so ingrained in the Muslim culture and teachings of our Prophet Sallallahu to serve and not to be thanked for it. To serve for the sake of Allah. Allah describes a believer in Surah Al-Insan. He says that when the believer feeds somebody, they say, we have fed you for the sake of Allah. We don't want any thanks, nor do we want any reward. We just did it for Allah's sake alone. So our goal as Muslims actually is to serve and not be, not be noticed, not be seen. Sheikh Sharawi has a very funny story he tells about this, where he says, one time this guy cooked dinner for his friends, and he invited all of them over. They came over, and as they were eating, it was delicious, and everyone started to compliment his wife's cooking. But he cooked. So the first guy was like, this meal is amazing. Please, compliments to the chef. Let her know. And he goes, no, no, I made this. And the guy was like, are you sure? He said, yeah. I was like, okay. Second guy took a bite. He's like, amazing. Tell your wife that this is an amazing recipe. And the guy goes, no, no, I made this. He goes, really? He goes, yeah. Third guy said the same thing. Man, your wife is, can she, can she teach my wife how to cook this? So they all got it wrong. Finally, the fourth guy goes, man, your wife is one of the best cooks I've ever had the pleasure of trying her food. And then the, by that moment, by the fourth guy, this guy realized, I'm insincere. I cooked for them, but I didn't cook for them. I actually cooked for them for me. Because if I cooked for them, I wouldn't care who was getting the compliment. As long as they're enjoying it, that's all that I care about. It doesn't matter if my wife gets the credit, or I get the credit, or they think that I catered. It doesn't matter, right? So finally, the fourth guy says, tell your wife she did a great job. He's like, I will. He accepted it because he realized that this is Allah teaching him a lesson. That when you serve people, you don't serve for the sake of being reciprocated. No. So Imam Ghazali here is saying, may Allah Ta'ala give you a long life. In what? In the servitude of Allah. When your head is on the ground, is there any better feeling? Is there any better feeling? Right? The best day so far for this year for me was Eid, the night before Eid, because I could make sajda again after my knee surgery. No better, all Ramadan, not a single moment I had my head on the floor. It was tough. It was tough. It's tough going down into sujood like this, seeing everyone else in front of you go properly. Right? Then he says, may Allah guide you to the right path of those who love him and those who are loved by him. Part of being a person that gets close to Allah is being around people that are close to Allah and that also want to get close to Allah. The first question a person on the path of Allah has to ask themselves, who am I surrounding myself with? You are the composite score of the people that you are spending your time with. There's no way around it. There's absolutely no way around it. We take, almost osmotically, we take the traits of the people that we spend time with. Just like the Prophet ﷺ said, a good friend is like one who sells perfume. A bad friend is like a person that is in the, in the, in the metal work, right? I, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, a blacksmith, a person who works with iron, or a mechanic, their hands get dirty. He says, it is, it is absolutely futile for you to avoid getting dirty if you hang out in the mechanic shop. You're going to get something. Like literally this happens to me all the time. When I'm back there behind the bar and I wear white. Worst decision ever. Because no matter what, if someone orders matcha, it's like a death sentence for my, for my shirt. Coffee, everything. Yeah, even if I try my best, right? Wear a shawl, cover it up like this, like an Eastern apron. I'm like, no, it doesn't work. SubhanAllah, even as hard as you try, you can't avoid your environment and how it affects you. You cannot. So the Prophet ﷺ said what? Put yourself in the environment of the one who sells perfume. Because even if you don't buy it, you'll still walk out smelling nice. Or you'll at least be able to say, man, I really enjoyed the scent. You'll take something. Okay? So he says, may Allah Ta'ala guide you to the right path of those who love him and who are loved by him. Become somebody that Allah loves and be in the circle of people that Allah loves by doing the things he loves together. Know, my son, that the real advice should be sought in the revelation and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. What's he saying here? This guy writes him a long letter asking him for life advice. Can you please tell me? And he says, no, right, K-N-O-W, no, my son, 
that real advice, if you really want to know the answer to this, then you should look into the Qur'an and the life of the Prophet What is he saying here? Hmm? Interesting. Interesting. How many of you are pretty good at something? Don't be shy. We'll say mashallah. Okay, mashallah. What are you pretty good at? Okay, mashallah. Do you coach? Okay. Has anyone asked you to teach them anything? Okay. So if someone asks you to teach them something that you're good at, and the first thing you do is reference them to something other than yourself, and you're good at something, you're good at this thing, then what does that say about you as a person? If they're like, can you teach me how to shoot that jump shot like that, the fadeaway, and you're like, actually, you pull up YouTube and you're like, look at this. This is Kobe. This is Michael Jordan. This is so-and-so. This is Dirk, right? You show them somebody else. They're asking you. You teach me. And you're like, let me show you. And you show them someone completely different. What does that say about you as a person? Humility. You're humble, right? If someone's really good at something, and, th and then you're approached, please teach me. You're so good. And they say, you know what? Let me show you. Let me show you where to find it. You are demonstrating. This is like a meta moment here. How many of us, when we do something, when we're good at we want to claim credit? Like, I want that credit. Hey, you're good at that. Can you show me how? Sure. How long did it take you to learn this? Oh, it's been a long time. I'm, you know, a lot of nights, sleepless. And you take all this credit. We love it. Like, pile it on, piled on, right? SubhanAllah, Imam Ghazali, who is like, do you guys want to know how much of a baller he was? He would teach at the premier university in Baghdad, the Nizamiya. His classroom was full of, not students, but other teachers, professors, would come and attend his class. Because why? Because they were so enamored by his knowledge that there would be no space for students. Students would be at the door like, uh, hello, I have to take this class. And the professors were like, leave us alone. So imagine being so good at something like that. And someone goes, please, teach me how you, how, you, how you mastered this. And the first thing you do is say, oh, just look in the Quran and the Sunnah. Everybody has access to it. What is he saying? It's nothing special. He said, you need to look there. If you have attained advice from it, then what do you need from me? What do you need from me? And if not, then what have you gained from all this time? Imam Ghazali is opening this letter by humbling himself in front of his student. Sometimes the first lesson you ever gain in life is by watching, not by listening. He's reading the words of his teacher and he's saying, man, this is a guy that I respect, that I've spent so much time with, that I've dedicated my life to, learning from him, and now I'm asking him for some advice and he's telling me that, don't ask me, just go to Allah. Just go to Allah. This is the demonstration of true humility, right? Okay. Now, the next section, he opens up with some advice. He says, among the many pieces of advice in which the Prophet Wasallam gave to Muslims was the following. So here's one of the most important pieces. The chapter heading was what? Time. Time is something that Allah Ta'ala swears by in the Qur'an. He swears by it. There's a chapter in the Qur'an, Asr, and there's also Surah Al-Dahr. Time. Time is something that's so, subhanAllah, it's so, it's, it's impossible to grasp, but it affects everything, right? You don't appreciate it when you have it, and you can't, you're so desperate for it when you don't have it. You know, it could be that you're, you're, you're one minute late to checking in your bag for your flight, and now you have to rebook, okay? It could be that you have all the time in the world on a layover in an airport. Both of those environments show you the exact diametric opposite of an experience with time. And we can't even grasp it. And then you get old, and what do you wish you did? I wish I used my time better. I wish I used my time better. When you're younger, you can't wait to get old. When you're older, you wish that you used your youth better. So time is very paradoxical, right? And that's why the Prophet ﷺ always talked about using time. And Muslims are people 
that in our religion is a consciousness of time. We're the only religion that has scheduled prayers at five intervals throughout the day, in part to manage our day. Because Ibn Atta'illah says, if Allah left it up to you, then you would not perform the five prayers at those times. You'd perform them whenever you could, if at all. So time is something incredibly valuable, and that's why he brings it up. He says that Allah, the sign that Allah has turned away from his worshiper. This is a, a, an Arabic expression that i'rad, to turn away from something, it means to completely and totally lose attention to that thing, to not care about it. If you don't care about something, you don't look at it anymore, right? So he says, a sign that Allah has turned away from his worshiper, which means a sign that Allah has ignored a person now. This person is not no longer in the focus of Allah Ta'ala, is that the person busies themselves with what does not concern them. Let me put this all on one screen so you guys can appreciate it in one go. Does this work? Okay, it won't work. Is that his worshiper is busying himself with what does not concern him. Raise your hand if you've ever been guilty of busying yourself with something that did not concern you. Okay. So this is something that then we all have experience with. I just, when was the last time you guys busied yourself with something that didn't concern you? Yesterday, okay. What do I mean by this? What does it mean to busy yourself with something that has, is not concerning to you? Let's make sure we're all defining this correctly. There's layers to it. What do you think of when I say that? Busying yourself with something that doesn't concern you. Social media, okay. Yeah, could be. A lot of it could be found on social media. Very good. What else? Does it really matter to me who Sean Mendez is dating now? Too many people know. That was a test. I don't even know her name, but I know you do. And that's why I said it, right? Right? But again, does it matter? No. But to them, sure. I'm sure it matters. May, you know, Allah give them Islam and allow them to get married. And but it doesn't matter to me, does it? Okay. So, but again, we are obsessed. I'll never forget when someone back in the Chicago, my, I'm a Chicago kid, in the 90s, right, Michael Jordan had an endorsement with Hanes. So he was all over the city with, and the country, really, with endorsement billboards for Hanes boxers and briefs, right? And I remember our teacher said, you know more about what underwear Michael Jordan wears than you know about the Prophet Sallallahu family. And he's like, and Michael Jordan doesn't even know you exist. But the Prophet Sallallahu made dua for you every night. He prayed for you. He said, Ummati, Ummati. Michael Jordan doesn't know you exist. The point he was trying to make to us was, you give yourself away, and you are finite. You are valuable. You're invaluable. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he was describing one of his companions. He said, in the eyes of Allah, you're priceless. Nothing in this dunya is worth you trading yourself for it. If you trade yourself for something here, you, you made a loss. You didn't make profit. Right? So your value is so high that the Prophet Sallallahu said that one of the signs that Allah has turned away from you, meaning that you have lost his favor, is that you start to occupy yourself with things that don't matter. So social media is one of them. What else? Yeah, Salahuddin. Okay, this is a great question. If I'm, if I'm confused about something, I ask myself one question. Is this benefiting me in my journey to Allah, or is this not? Am I moving forwards or backwards? Because there's no such thing as standing still, by the way. You're either moving forwards, even incrementally, even a millimeter, or you're moving backwards. And so if I'm, if I'm addressing something in my life, if I'm listening to something, if I'm speaking, if I'm watching something, I have to ask myself. Now, this doesn't mean that a person has to be constantly engaged in study and academics. No. The Prophet, one time he raced his wife Aisha in the desert. In fact, twice. Right? The first time she won. The second time he won. 
Is that a waste of time? Because they're racing? No, the Prophet Sallallahu enjoyed recreation. The companions used to describe him. They used to say, he used to sit with us, he used to eat with us, he used to laugh with us, he used to cry. He was a social person, salam. So when we're talking about using your time wisely, we're not talking about people that are so super, hyper, absolutely, insustainably, unsustainably efficient that it's almost like not real. No. We're talking about at the end of the day when you put your head down on the pillow to go to sleep and you think about everything that you did. Did you end your day closer to Allah or further away than when you began? That's the question. Okay? And when a person occupies themselves thinking about other people, wondering about them, backbiting them, slandering them, when a person occupies themselves immersed in the narrative and in the minutia and nuance of someone's life, meanwhile, they themselves are neglecting their own responsibilities, their own uh, 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 you know, their own life, their own minutia, their own nuances, right? How many people talk poorly about other people's families while neglecting their own family? It's like, instead of spending time talking about this person's divorce, maybe you can save your own marriage, right? Instead of talking about people's kids, maybe you can go read to your own kids, right? There's a novel idea, no pun intended. Maybe, a little bit. So, the point being is that the Prophet ﷺ taught us that at the core of evil character is that you're not valuing your time. A person who has character flaws, who backbites, who lies, who does all that, you're not, value, you're not understanding time. You don't realize how valuable this time is. You're wasting it away. Why does a person lie? I'll tell the truth tomorrow. You don't even know if you're going to be here tomorrow. You have to tell the truth while you're alive. Be honest while you're here because you don't know if you'll have the chance. Okay? So he says that the person busies themselves with what does not concern them. Even more strong now, he says, and if a person has passed an hour of their life for other than which they were created, an hour is a long time, then he says it is certainly fitting that they should experience a prolonged grief. Have you guys ever looked down at the clock at 11 p.m., looked at your phone, looked back at the clock, and it's 1 a.m.? And you're like, how did I get sucked into that black hole of scroll, man? Like, subhanAllah. You look and you're like, how on earth did I waste that much time? You promised yourself you were going to go to sleep early to get rest. You promised yourself you weren't going to waste time. You promised yourself. But it just pulls you in. That first step, it's a slippery slope. And that's why he said, if you do this, if you consistently waste an hour of your life, then he's like, the grief you feel, basically in Arabic, what it translates to is, you have no one to blame but yourself. The Prophet ﷺ says, if you waste your time, you got no one to blame. On the Day of Judgment, we're all going to stand there pointing fingers, and what is Shaytan going to say? What is Allah going to say? Shaytan's actually going to say the truth for once in his life. He's going to say what? He's going to say, oh Allah, I did not I did not make that person do anything. I didn't take his hand and move it. I didn't take her eyes and keep them open. I didn't do any of that. All I did was whisper, and I left. And this person decided to take the idea in their heart and act on it. And Allah will say, you're correct. Shaitan has no power over us. So on that day, we're going to be pointing at Shaitan like, get him. It was him. Everyone. Blame Shaitan. But Shaitan's going to say, look, the reality is, I pulled you down, but only with my words. I didn't have the physical ability to, to touch you. Okay? And then he finishes by saying, whoever has reached the age of 40, and this is scary, because I know that we're getting to 40 and up. I call it 30 and up so we don't feel bad. But I'm 35, so it's like 40 and up maybe? 30 and up just stops. <laughs> okay? Whoever has reached the age of 40 and their good does not surpass their evil. This is pretty serious. Then he says, let them prepare for the fire. This isn't the Prophet Sallallahu wishing this upon anybody. This isn't the Prophet Sallallahu saying that for sure this is going to happen. What's he saying here? He's saying, what do you think he's saying? Whoever reaches the age of 40 
and their good is not more than their evil, then let them prepare themselves for a seat in the fire. What is he saying? It's harder to break habits at that age. What does every old person say? Old meaning us. What do we start to say when we reach 35, 40? Huh? Okay, so there's the, I'm not going to change. Have any of you tried to pick up like a new sport? Yeah, p- things get harder. Things that you used to be able to do very easily are now difficult. Right? People are like, I used to be able to stay up all night. Now I need like eight, nine, ten hours of sleep. I used to be able to run like this much. Now I can't. I used to be able to. Ju- I used to be able to play basketball for four hours. Now I can barely dribble. I used to be able to do this, this, this. Your body is actually a spiritually constructed sign for you that you can't change at a certain point. Everyone is. It's possible, but it's very difficult. And just as much as it's difficult for a person to change when they get older, just as much as it's difficult for a person to change when they get older, physically, their metabolism slows down, all these things start to occur, you know, biologically, physiologically, it's different, it's difficult. Then subhanAllah, the Prophet says spiritually, it's very similar. If you get set in your ways, if a person for 20, 30 years of their you know, mature cognitive life from the age of 10, 12, 15 has been looking at the same things and speaking about the same things and listening to the same things and they have not used the mature, ripe time of their life, 20s and 30s, to really capitalize into the decade of wisdom, which is 40s, then it's very difficult to make that U-turn. It's very challenging. So what's he saying? Make the change before it becomes tougher because every day of your life, the change becomes more challenging. It's a paradox. We keep telling ourselves we'll do it tomorrow, but tomorrow it's actually harder. It'd be easier to start today. We keep telling ourselves next year or the year after, but subhanAllah, it's actually the easiest it'll be for us right now. It will never be easier for us to come closer to Allah than it is in this moment. Because the next moment and the one after that, it becomes more challenging because we become more set. The concrete becomes more dry. And that's what the hadith is telling us. He's not saying it's certain, but he's saying, man, if you don't have the motivation and the dedication to change by 40, so much so that your bad outweighs your good, he's like, it's not looking good. It's not looking good. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us tawfiq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us be people that are motivated to always turn to him and come close to him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to always be people that our good is more than our bad. We ask Allah ta'ala to allow these realizations to set into us gently so that we can turn to him and be people that are close to him and live our life journeying to him constantly. Amin ya rabbil alameen. Okay. Um, our next session, inshallah, is going to be on one of my favorite topics, which is nasiha, advice. Uh, he begins by saying, advising others is an easy matter. Advising people is easy, right? If I asked you guys, hey, give me some advice. You probably have 100 people that are like, do this, do that, do this. Don't put milk in your car. <laughs> Make sure you take it out before you leave, right? I'd have a million people give me advice. It's easy, right? He says the difficulty is accepting it. Advising others is easy. But you know what's tough? Accepting advice. Since this is a bitter thing for people, especially for those who follow their own desires. So we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to, number one, advise? What does it mean to be advised? And how do we become better at both? How do we become better at both? Advising and accepting advice. Because that's the path of coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah ta'ala to accept from us. Barakallahu feekum. Anyone have any questions on the first? We're going to end with questions every week so people can ask if they have anything, inshallah. Yeah.
Sure. So very good question. There's levels to this. And that, the, the answer is actually that there's layers to this. What is included in occupying your time with that which does not concern you? There's two answers I want you to remember. And I'm, ha I'm happy you asked this because I, I don't think I gave the threshold. The first of these two conditions is that you cannot be occupying yourself in such a way that you neglect the obligations of your faith to Allah. Okay? So recreation's okay as long as you're not skipping your prayer. Shopping is okay as long as you're not avoiding your zakat. You know, eating and drinking is fine as long as you're fasting in Ramadan. And to live your entire life is expected, but don't forget about making your hajj. So you have five daily obligations, right, or five obligations, some of them daily, some of them are, uh, uh, you know, the pillars of Islam, obviously. As long as you are not skirting those pillars and those obligations with how you are occupying your time, then your occupation of your time is okay. So if a person wants to watch a series, as long as the series is not haram, that's fine. And that's the second condition. The first condition is you have to be meeting your obligations. The second condition is what you are doing with your time can also not be a, a vice in and of itself. So you can't say, well, I pray my prayers, and now I'm going to watch this movie that I know has you know, inappropriate content in it or something, right? So the two things that need to be watched out for are, am I doing what Allah has asked me to do? And am I staying away with my time? Am I staying away from the things that Allah has asked me to stay away from, has told me to stay away from? Those are the two conditions. As long as you can say yes and yes, then what you're doing with your time is not problematic. Now, there is a layer above that, which is not mandatory, it is recommended, which is every person will only achieve as much as they invest. So if I'm performing my prayers and doing everything I'm obligated, and I'm not doing something haram, but I'm still using every waking moment that I have playing NBA 2K. I can't expect magically to find myself close to Allah at the end of the day if I didn't do a little bit more. Okay, So there's a bare minimum, but then there's a recommendation. We start with the bare minimum. Let's make sure that we're not avoiding the obligations, those things Allah has told us to do. Let's make sure we're not doing the things that Allah has prohibited us from doing. But then on top of that, what am I doing to do a little bit more? Because in anything that you want to do that you're successful in, you always do more. Right? So there's kind of two layers to it. There's two requirements, and then there's one recommendation above that. As long as we are fulfilling those two requirements with our time, then we don't, we're not considered from the person that is using their time for that, which is not uh, uh, um, you know, of their concern. Allahu Alam. Yeah, very good question. Yeah. No, you're good. This book was written, or these letters were written, Imam al-Ghazali existed roughly a thousand years ago. So, so it was written quite a while ago, yeah. Yeah. You're like, can we get a couple more decades? <laughs> You're like, uh, inflation's pretty bad. Uh, does that factor into this hadith at all? So that's a good question. So 40 actually, 40 as an age, 40 as a number, uh, is actually a number that the Arabs used uh, both as a rhetorical tool, but also they used it literally. Rhetorical meaning that somebody would say they were 40, as a demonstration of an attainment of maturity and wisdom. Why did they say that? Because typically at the age of 40 is when a person starts to make better decisions, starts to think more rationally about things, right? They have enough life experience. So, you know, given that the life of the Prophet ﷺ was 63 years and that he, ach he achieved prophethood at the age of 40, that's when he was given prophethood. Um, I think the number 40 is, is still somewhat relevant in our tradition. But I do think ultimately what it's trying to refer to is if you, have a t if you have reached a point in your life where you are halfway or more done with your expected lifetime and you haven't figured it out yet, then 
there's something critically wrong with the path that you're on and you need to seriously assess what you're doing. Like if I'm 40 and I'm still making the same mistakes I made when I was 15 or 20 or 25 or whenever, I have an issue, I have a problem. I need to, I need to, to refine myself. I can't keep lying and cheating and hurting people into my 40s. It doesn't make sense. Figure out how to manage your life, right? You have, Allah has given you your teens and your 20s and your 30s. The Prophet said by the time you hit 40, you're not going to have much momentum going the other way. Yeah. So I think 40 is still, I know the life expectancy and, you know, that's, that's a good point. But I, I think 40 is still there. Wallahu alam. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Like I'm live streaming this right now, so like or if I were sincere, I would just come and teach this and the room would be empty. Yeah. So I mean, sure, you're right in the sense that, okay, if a person wants like ultimate sincerity, then they would effectively not want to ever be in the, in the threat or the vulnerability of their intention being compromised. Here's what Imam al-Ghazali says, and others, Ibn al-Qayyim, other scholars. They say that the Prophet وسلم, and Islam as a whole, actually, the Quran as well, obligated things to be done in congregation, which means that they're done in visibility. This means that a person cannot run away for the sake of sincerity. They have to, they have to fight themselves, right? Sometimes achieving the goal you want is not about patting yourself with pillows to make it always easy to win that battle. Sometimes you have to fight the battle and win the battle. So if I want to be sincere, but part of that action requires me to be visible and announce and to use my platform to talk and to do, put a flyer, right, and be the, the leader of something or the organizer. But then I think to myself, people are going to respect me more if I donate or this and that. It's not about giving up. It's about fighting that moment. So the scholars have given some really good advice on how to fight that moment. One that I really love is that they say you need to overly – you need to make abundant the things you do in private so that when you do have to do something in public, it's no big deal. You know, uh, when the lights are shining their brightest and everyone's watching, you won't even be tempted to think about them at all because you do good things alone all the time. But if the only time I do good is when people are watching, then I'm going to start to feel anxious and nervous about showing off. Right? If I pray at home all the time, praying in front of people, I won't even think twice about it. This is just what I do at home. But if the only time I pray is when I'm around people, then naturally it's going to be a temptation for me to think, let me get up so people think that I pray. Make sense? Yeah. So my, my advice for sincerity is make abundant the good deeds you do in private. That way when you're in public, you don't even have to think twice about it. Yeah. Allahu Alam. Yeah. Subhanallah. Last question. Yeah. Yeah, so if you if you change the quality or the quantity of your deed when you're around people, it could be a bad sign. It's not always cuz sometimes the jama'a is encouraging. So it's not always I'm doing it for them. Sometimes like when you're at home there's no one around you to like remind you to pray sunnah and you're like, "Okay, you know, and you get up and you go do your thing or you check your phone." But then sometimes when you're in a congregation, you see somebody get up and they're like, I'll talk with you after sunnah. Like, let's go out after. Let me just pray my sunnah, and then we can go. And in that moment, you're prompted to also do the same thing. That's not showing off as much as it's the, the, the power of being in good company. So as long as you don't feel internally that I'm going to do this only so that this person thinks that I'm pious and holy, then that's fine. 
Okay, and another way to, again, to b combat that is to develop some experience and portfolio of private extra good deeds, at least sometime. That way you don't have to always manage and walk that tightrope. It gets more challenging the less private good deeds you have. It gets more challenging, yeah. Same with donating. People hate donating in public because they want to keep it sincere. Just donate more in private, right? I, I actually had a friend, subhanAllah, he used to raise his hand for a certain amount, and then when the pledge card came, he would write down double. You guys get that? So that everyone thought he only gave 500, but then he'd write 1,000. And when I found out, because I saw him, I was like, weren't you a 500? He's like, yeah. He's like, I do this so that people think that I gave less than I did. And I was like, wow, that's crazy, because usually we want people to think that we gave more, right, for showing off. And it's actually exactly what Abu Bakr Siddiq said. He said, Allahumma la tu akhidhni bima yaqulun. Oh Allah, don't hold, <coughs> don't hold me to account for what they say about me. And he says, وَجَعَلْنِي خَيْرًا مِمَّا يَظُنُّونَ Make me better than what they think about me. Make me better than what people think about me. And then he says, وَغْفِرْ لِي بِمَا لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And forgive me for the things they don't know about me. Abu Bakr, this is the Prophet's best friend. So this idea of sincerity is something that's very, very important. Very, very important. So we ask Allah Ta'ala to accept. Okay, Maghrib time, inshaAllah, we're going to head over to the Masallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa antina astaghfirik wa tabu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.